So let's see if we can get a little more directness on this um, issue. So suppose think of the examples um, with color. So um, suppose quite literally, um, as it is claimed that there are people who, and, and most of us don't doubt it, there are people who are supposedly colorblind. Um, that really is supposed to mean that reality, I mean, so everything that we call reality has, um, so to speak, for its surface, but what does surface mean? Um, if you peel the orange, then you just have another surface. You have the orange inside under the peel, so to say that color is the surface of things um, is misleading, and, and um, indeed it's radically misleading because there's nothing else but the surface with respect to color. So if color is different, and in a way when we speak of people being colorblind, we kind of think we can understand what that would mean, but it would be a whole different world, literally. Um, but we kind of understand what that means because we think it's just a deprivation. In other words, we have more colors, we who, I mean, provided that we're, that we're not... Um, colorblind ourselves, supposedly we have more colors and they have less. So therefore it's not radically different, it's just that they're deprived. And then supposedly there are some, maybe as many as 25% of the population has more. They have four um, cones instead of three. They're tetrachromide, um, or however that is said, tetrachromatic. Um, this, um, we ourselves are not tetrachromatic, uh, apparently we cannot even imagine that. So you can kind of say to yourself, um, and Hume poses this problem, um, suppose I have three or four different shades of blue, and suppose I get a color, um, a book on colors, and I get ten shades of blue or so, and then somewhere there's some gaps where you can see that you're not seeing blue, and then you can ask yourself, is there any way, and then rationally you have at your disposal this idea that there's some gaps, just as in, say, um, the periodic table or something, you know, there's some, um, supposedly some, some gaps, or there were some gaps. Um, and you could ask yourself, is it possible at all, say, for instance, in a dream, that you might see those colors that are missing? Um, these kind of examples don't particularly um, trouble the so-called um, realists, the Denite people, because they think following Descartes, Descartes came up with this theory of the um, um, showing the uh, color spectrum um, quantitatively. They think that they can refer to that and that gets them out of it. So like, yes, everyone subjectively is in a totally different world, almost like a virtual, re each one's in their own virtual reality, but it's okay because we can link it all together and make it quote unquote objective by referring to um, the quantitative, referring to the color spectrum, which we can always derive. But now take the problem out and, and don't just say color, but apply it to everything, to um, the entirety of our experience. Um, to occur, full stop. Um, so allow that to include also, for instance, the solidity of things. Now, there are people, of course, who don't experience solidity. They usually die fairly young because they um, injure themselves, uh, put their hand in boiling water and don't feel the pain, or um, apparently they don't turn over in their sleep, which causes them to um, injure themselves. But some of them do live for a while. Um, and there's not, ultimately, I don't believe that it's cogent to say that uh, survival is... Um, in fact, it's it's absolutely not cogent to say survival is, is a standard in any way because you could simply imagine a, a cushy world, a world which was designed in, in perfectly to uh, make these people um, the most fit in it. Um, so long as the world would change, the environment would be different. Um, whatever the um, supposed lack of fitness were, it, it could be made to be a fitness in some other um, arrangement of the environment. That's absolutely not cogent. Um, 
So if you take it radically, this is how Nietzsche thinks. He, he thinks everything out to the, um, the greatest extreme. He thinks it's the, the furthest point. And there's no reason not to think it out that way, except that we're relying on a sort of a dumb uh, common sense, which amounts to saying this is what we're used to. And we've experienced it a million times um, in the last 70,000 years as human beings. This is what we're used to. Therefore, it's reality. But so you see what the problem that Nietzsche is dealing with here is everything that we have at our disposal as experiences um, is disposable in this way and can't is unreliable in this way. So once you see that, and if this were to form a conviction based on seeing the long run, based on seeing the, um, the, the, the these positions pushed out the furthest they can possibly push out, then you start to think in a different way. So I think it's starting from a point like this where we get this break from the, um, the other tradition, from the, the pre-Heideggerian tradition, as it were. Um, but um, Heidegger will claim that, um, I believe what he's saying is what Nietzsche doesn't do is he doesn't... Um, find the new position that Heidegger finds in the same way. He doesn't um, take the Dasein position um, in the same directions, for instance, by showing that um, you can think the subject and the object on the same ground as being something different than subject to object or as being Dasein. But we have to look at that in more um, close detail. So in Descartes, I believe we were looking at Descartes a little while back, um, where you see that um, you can regard all our awareness and um, everything that's there as existence, existence and thinking as overlapping and moving and blinking back and forth, as it were. Um, what Descartes leaves out here, he, this is based on a, um, a radical exclusion of what traditionally would be called ontology, where ontology um, doesn't mean what it means in the um, analytical philosophy departments today, where it's just um, um, set in contradistinction to uh, theories, theories of knowledge, but rather ontolo uh, ontological truth in the old tradition means truth about God. So um, what that means can be seen clearly in the um, George Barclay position. So George Barclay's position is um, monotonously and um, everywhere misconstrued, but it can be very easily demonstrated that um, the way he's presented in the analytic philosophy departments is, is simply a fiction and nonsense. What he means um, quite clearly by essay percipi is that um, perception by God is reality. So not perception by the human being, as they were constantly told in the idiotic um, analytic philosophy departments who have never, um, they won't touch theology books. They say everything is a theological argument. Everything is not a real logical argument, even though um, logic is really developed by the medieval theologians primarily in the medieval universities, which makes it all the more um, obtuse and... and um, what can one say, idiotic. Um, but this is what Barclay has meant. He's meant that things um, exist because they're perceived by God. So he says clearly the horse is in the stable. What he means by that is it doesn't matter if we're looking at the horse. The horse is still in the stable because it's still observed as a percipi, meaning that it's still observed in reality. And reality there is just another name for... Um, you know, this had all these names in the tradition, Zeus, Deus, Theos, God, whatnot. Let's just allow that to just be a technical term, and then you can remove some of your superstition around that. Um, this position um, is, is, has something to do with what Heidegger is trying to get to. Um, so not the George Barclay that we're told, uh, but the actual George Barclay. Now... What we should try to look at here, um, what I want to show more closely, is how does Heidegger 
break with Hustral and what does it mean that he throws off the thinking or what we could also call consciousness in the Cartesian position to move towards this third pole. So you have the one pole of existence, which is more like perception. You have the other pole of the um, consciousness or um, cognito or thinking. But then you have a third pole, which is the ontological truth. So um, you could say, uh, but I think I don't have enough time to get there. But it's clear why you can throw off the perception because um, of the basically because of the Nietzschean issues we were just going into. It's like no matter how much data you get out of the random accidental perception, you never get to. Um, uh, Nietzsche is giving the example of a leaf, I think. You never get to the leaf itself, as it were. You're just getting different um, permutations of um, things of different sizes and shapes and so on and so forth. And you get all this data forever and ever, and you never get there. But what Heidegger wants to say is, even from Husserl's point of view, where he's coming in from consciousness, he's also saying you never get there from the point of view. You never get there from the point of view of existence, but we have to look at that more closely so we can actually build a conviction to show why people are convinced this is true, why Nietzsche and Heidegger were, really had a conviction that this made sense. But we have to show also why, from the point of view of consciousness, of thinking, you can never get there. And so, therefore, why Heidegger tried to look for this third path. So that's what we're going to um, try to look at as we go forward.